If you go out in the hills today, you're almost sure for a big, big surprise. Oh, how naive we are as a species. Just because we've built a road somewhere, we think we're safe to travel there and explore and go around and have as much fun as we want. Well, as the protagonists in tonight's story find out, that isn't always the case. Another 24 karat gold classic for you from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. This one is not to be missed, my dear friends. So, once again, it's time for you to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tensing the wheel in my fingers, I grin. Oh, you'd think it'd be cooler. We're so close to the beach. Bennett groaned, rolling his window back up and tilting the air-conditioning vent towards himself. I told you we should have gone later. Not in the middle of the bloody day. Emily spoke in a smoky British accent, rolling her eyes just before deeply inhaling from the bong we were passing around. No way. Two o'clock is already late enough. If we went later, it would have been even creepier. Natalie took the bong next, and activated the flint lighter that paired with the glass, and lighting the last of the green within the bowl. She held it in for about a second, and burst out coughing, unable to control herself. Emily laughed boisterously at this, patting the girl's back as she opened her own window, and continued her choking outside of the car, courteous as ever. Oh, get her a water, would you? Bennett barked back. Oh, for fuck's sake... Unless you want me to reach over you, Ems. Is that what you want? You want me to rub you all over? Why do you always have to be such a pervert? And I told you not to call me that. Emily snorted, reaching into the ice cooler we carried in the rear area of the SUV, and creaked the noisy lid open, pulling out an iced cold water bottle. She stuck it to the back of Natalie's neck, to which the still coughing woman reeled back in surprise, hitting her head on the way back in. Oh, damn it, Emily, she cried. Well, had to get your attention, didn't I? Emily shrugged apathetically, a sly grin crossing her face. <laughs> yeah, keep getting her, Ems. You show what you think of her stupid plan. Bennett laughed. He then looked to me as I kept my eyes on the small dirt road ahead. Excuse me for not being a psychopath. Natalie spoke in a hoarse voice, taking the water and rubbing her head. Generally, exploring the wilderness isn't a good idea past sundown. Well, the more time we have, the better, no? She drank deeply from the bottle, looking relieved. You better not have spilled that bong water back there, I murmured, peering into the rear view at Natalie. I caught it, don't worry. Emily smiled to me in the mirror. I couldn't help but smile back. From the first moment I'd met her, I was positively enthralled. Her silky dark hair and enticing grey eyes were enough to drive any man wild, to say nothing of her olive-toned skin and limber yet supple body. Bennett had never let me live down that I'd met her through Natalie, and always held it over my head. Even though we technically weren't dating, I can say that we certainly clicked on many things. Hey, navigator, how much further? Bennett reached back and poked Natalie in one of her breasts. Stop, she moaned, pulling back, pushing her horn-rimmed glasses back to her nose. And I told you, the map's scarcely accurate here. We're better off guessing. Unless Reese also happens to know the exact distance from the start to the cemetery. She looked pointedly at me in the rear view as we rumbled along the dirt path. Yeah, she's got a point, pal. You sure this is the right one? There were about ten other ways at the divide back there. Bennett leaned back in his seat, grinning cockily at me. Bennett was most definitely the most outgoing of the four of us, but his career purchased him that right. As a man in the Marine Corps, he didn't skimp out on playing the tough guy whenever he could, especially around Natalie. His stocky, chiseled body easily showed through his muscle shirt and swimming trunks, complimenting his militaristic crew cut quite well. I was always puzzled at how he and Natalie came to be a couple. She was the opposite of his vehement personality, shy and recessed. 
Despite her cute looks, composed of short blonde hair and dazzling blue eyes, Natalie had always had issues interacting with other people. She much preferred books and movies, but somehow Bennett had gotten to her, and they'd been inseparable for over three years now. Your consternation is understandable, but worry not, my comrades. I've travelled this path before with my dad. He was the one that showed me the cemetery and the caves in the first place. Wait, you never said you'd been here before. Emily grinned to me. Did you go inside the caves? Natalie asked, her voice tinged with nervousness. Consternation, Bennett repeated, more to himself than to us. Here, pack another one. It's story time. Emily handed the bong to Natalie, who held possession of the grinder and the rest of the marijuana. Not much to tell, I shrugged. But Dad didn't hold back on the many Baroque edifications, despite the fact I was only a minor. Dude, can you stop with your English major talk? You're giving me a headache, Bennett grunted, leaning back in his seat. You're not drinking enough, dummy. Here. Natalie handed him the rest of her bottle. He sighed, taking the water and quickly finishing it off. Crushing the bottle in his hand, he rolled his window quickly down and tossed the plastic into the dry, tall grass that surrounded us at both sides as we climbed the mountain. Hey, you can't do that, Bennett. That's why I brought a trash bag, Natalie cried. Oh, it'll degrade in a few hundred years. No worries. Bennett smugly grinned back at her his eyes leering as she glared at him. Guys, shh, I, I want to bloody hear it. Emily shushed the other two, leaning closer to me as though in anticipation. At the time, I didn't really see the reality of her many subtle cues, frankly because I thought there was no way she'd be attracted to me. She was, after all, out of my league, in my opinion. Lanky, tall, and too wordy for my own damn good. I laughed at the notion of a seductress such as herself being into me, but well, I digress. Dad told me that the cemetery has a nickname, the 90s Graveyard. He told me that the entire road up to the caves is cursed, getting progressively worse as you ascend, I explained. They were silent, all listening intently. The only noise in our vehicle was the rumbling of the engine and the metallic scraping of Natalie's grinder. That curse derives from a malignant force, pernicious and biting in a tumultuous, horrific further, an abject and incontrovertible evil rooted many years back. I dramatically spoke. Oh, dude, you trying to piss me off now? Bennett socked my shoulder. Even if he hadn't meant to hurt me, he certainly did. I recoiled. Don't be a jerk. I like his big words, Natalie chided, socking his shoulder in turn. Me too. Emily spoke in a more gushy voice, again right over my head. Not really many years, <laughs> I chuckled, peering out into the scenery as we climbed up the large, hilly area. Even in Malibu, only a few miles from the coast, the California heat still permeated. Besides the line of oaks that seemed to ascend the mountain with us, not much more could be said of the landscape. Of course, the old jeep trail was surrounded at either side by imposing waist-high grass. But it had long since gradated into the dry golden colour so ubiquitous. Hence the name. It was a couple of decades back, either 94 or 95. But anyway, this was back during the good old days, when schools could actually afford real field trips, I said. There was this class from one of the elementary schools around here, I think closer to the Pepperdine area. Well, they were studying geology, and the teacher elected to propose a field trip to the caves up here as a perfect object lesson of porous rocks and such. Now, even fewer people knew about the cave system up here at this time, and apparently the only way the teacher knew was because he was part of an underground spelunking enthusiast group. Ooh, really? That sounds niche. Natalie spoke slowly, finishing her packing of the bong and handing it to me. I shook my head and pointed to Bennett. Him next. Not while I'm driving, I informed her, not taking my eyes from the trail. 
She made a pouting face at me in the rear view, and passed the glass next to my burly friend, who lit it and inhaled. It might, but it was a natural thing at Pepperdine. They had meetings, luncheons, and of course secret discussions about the most untouched cave systems in the local area. The teacher, being an alumni, thought it would be an excellent idea to take his kids up to this place that he'd already scouted, and take them inside a little ways, maybe a quarter mile at most. He doled out little flashlights and everything. The kids were really excited, of course. What child wouldn't be? They all piled into one of those old-fashioned yellow school buses, the type with the engine at the nose, rather than the back like they are nowadays. The driver was an old guy that had been serving the district for over a decade, so the teacher trusted him to make all the right turns without any issues. I continued. Let me guess. Something bad happened to the bus, right? Bennett jeered, a toothy grin on his face as he coughed lightly. Shut up, Bennett. Natalie smacked his chest as Emily took the bong next. Oh, I'm getting to that. Now it was a long, hard trek up this trail for such a large vehicle, but not impossible. Slowly but surely, they made their way up to this very same trail we're going on. Whereas it would take an off-roader like us about half an hour to get to the top, at best, it took the bus about three times as long. But the teacher was determined, and egged the driver on, even though he insisted the engine might not have made it with a strain. Eventually, They got to the upper area of the mountain, where the incline starts to peter out into a more tolerable gradient. The driver climbed all the way to the top, winding around the bends with difficulty, given it was such a cumbersome vehicle. But there had been no close calls, thankfully, and they made it to the tippy top. I pointed through the windshield to our current destination, visible at its distance to be much higher than we currently were. Damn! Here I was thinking the bus was going to get messed up, Bennett chuckled, locking his hands together behind his head. See what happens when you interrupt, idiot, Natalie scolded. Well, driver stays at the bus while the teacher herds the kids to the entrance of the cave. The teacher told him that, if they weren't back in an hour, to go and get help. This was in the days before cell phones were commonplace, you see, so that meant the driver would have to take the bus all the way back down. Find a phone at the gas station we passed on the way up here, which was apparently still there all those years ago. Except, back then it was some family-owned joint, and not a mobile. Let me guess. The kids got lost and died, right? Bennett interjected, grinning frivolously. Shut up, Bennett, Natalie repeated, pummeling his broad shoulder again. Seriously? Emily glared at him. He shrugged and put his hands up in submission. All right, jeez, sorry. Well, the teacher led the kids inside and showed them all the way through the area he wanted. The calcification, the limestone, the way water dripped through porous rock, and so on. Supposedly, it was a very successful run-through, without a single injury to be had by any of the kids. The teacher came out with all twenty or so children, just before the hour mark. They all ate their lunches in a little picnic outside the bus, kind of just sitting in the shade and relaxing. After they were done, they filed back onto the bus and started descending back down the mountain, I told them. I then put on a darker tone of voice for the next part, also lowering my cadence. Now, you guys have to understand. The road becomes treacherous once we really get high up. It has a series of switchbacks, none of which have any guardrails implemented. I don't know why the teacher thought it would be a good idea to take such an unwieldy vehicle up there to such a place that required finesse to scale. But they'd gone up without a hitch, so going down was no worry to the group as they descended. However, they missed a certain patch of plants on the way up, A very dangerous sort of plant in such a precarious position. The other three were enthralled, even Bennett now. They all watched me silently, taking hits from the bongs they passed it around. Bindiweed. You might know them better as goat heads. Nasty little buggers that pierce through tires pretty regularly. They're basically mini caltrops that grow in the drier parts of the world, 
especially the southwestern United States. Everyone's talking and laughing, in high spirits after the cave trip, and as the driver rounds the turn of one of the higher switchbacks, he plows right over this patch of bindi weed. Boom! Ordinarily, one goat head wouldn't be enough to puncture a car tire, but the driver ran through a ton of them, and some of them got through to the inner tube. The tire quickly went flat, and he lost control of the turn. No way! Goat heads! I've had them go through my bike tires, but... Bennett sighed, sounding genuinely dismayed at the news. Though I ventured to guess he was more easily entertained due to his, well, many inhalations. Yep, that's what the reports read it as. You have to remember that this was an older bus, so it had probably been using the factory tyres it came with. Once those get worn down, the smallest things can penetrate. But anyways, I continued, voice dour, the bus falls off the cliff and tumbles all the way down to PCH, eventually coming to a rest against a concrete divider. Where they fell, it was a sheer cliff followed by a less steep hill that runs all the way down to the highway. From eyewitness accounts, they said the bus fell on its tires after the cliff, but the force caused it to bounce back up and roll all the way down the mountain. It came to a rest on its tires again, just barely stopping before it rolled into oncoming traffic, thanks to the barrier it hit. Holy shit, Natalie voiced in awe. Oh, yeah, holy shit indeed, Bennett grunted. So, what happened to the people inside? I gave them a rueful smile and shook my head. You three will see when we get up there. But the height they initially fell from, plus all the tumbling they did, well, the driver and all the kids, they perished. And the teacher? Emily asked, mesmerized. Severe contusions and a veritable shit ton of broken bones. He was unconscious when they found him, laying upon a carpet of corpses, as the first responders quoted. The whole floor in there was supposedly red, and even the ceiling dripped with blood. It was a huge, god-awful mess for everyone to deal with. The coroners, the city workers that had to deal with a busted divider, and all the pieces of the bus that had been left behind up the hill. And the police, who had to direct traffic as they cleaned up the wreckage and tell their parents, I described. That's horrible, Natalie exclaimed, appearing sickened. Yep, huge lawsuits followed against the school district, and rightfully so, I'd say. It was an enormous deal back then, I told them. What about the teacher? Did he go to jail? Bennett asked. I shook my head. They got him to the hospital and tried getting statements from him, but one of his lungs had collapsed and he was anemic, too much so to speak. They put him back out pretty much right after he woke up and kept him that way for several days. He was in and out of consciousness for those days and every time he came to, the nurses reported hearing him mumbling something incomprehensible, sounding only like gurgling to them. They didn't figure out what he was attempting to voice, since they always had to put him right back out as soon as he woke up, since his vitals never stabilized. Six days after they brought him in, though, he finally succumbed to his injuries and died in his bed. Damn, Bennett muttered. They kept the poor bastard alive just to suffer for six days. <sighs> Something like that ever happens to me. Oh, just put a bullet in my brain pan. He raised his fingers to his cranium in the shape of a pistol and pretended to fire it. So they never understood what he was saying? Emily questioned. That's the kicker, I smiled at her. The doctors supposedly heard the heart rate monitors going haywire in the room and rushed in just as they flatlined and the teacher fell dead back in his bed. Apparently, it wasn't the ambient injuries that actually killed him but the shock induced by a final strain. What was the strain? Natalie asked, sounding nervous again. Her arms were crossed over her buxom chest, a telltale sign she was becoming frightened. 
he'd reached to a clipboard one of the doctors left behind at his bedstand and scrawled something barely legible in pen over the charts. Multiple people looked at it and confirmed they read the same message. Which was? Emily inquired. There, still trapped up there. No one spoke after the final line of my story. There was only one sound, the car tires outside, crunching against pebbles and rocks as I drove further up. Bennett, naturally, was the one to break the silence. What did he mean by that? I shrugged. Of course, they chalked it up to delirium. He was in a horrible state after the crash and had suffered head trauma. No one really gave it too much thought at the time. After the whole fiasco was over, the parents went up there in a group, along with many family friends and whatnot. They constructed a memorial of sorts and paid their respects. And thus, the 90s graveyard was born. No one else really came up here after the little ones fell. The only ones who did were urban explorers like us, spelunking enthusiasts who preferred to ignore the taboo of treading hollow ground, and very occasionally... I deliberately trailed off. What? Natalie asked, teeth chattering as she huddled away from the air conditioner into Emily, though I believe the temperature was not the cause of this. Paranormal investigators, I dramatically finished. No one spoke once again. I continued, breaking the short silence. You see, there are some who believe that the teacher, so close to death, was able to see the spirits of the deceased children and driver and realize where they were. The theory goes that before their souls could rise up from the wreckage into heaven, they instead became trapped in the caves above and never moved on. These theorists have dubbed the previously unnamed mountain tunnels the Angel Caves, and the colloquial remains even today. Hence the final message he left behind, before very suddenly dying. Anyone ever found anything? Bennett asked, his voice laced with incredulity. No idea. The PI teams are usually private, and scarcely share their findings beyond themselves. Usually it's just ghost hunter hobbyists and enthusiasts that come up, from what I've heard anyway. There's never actually been any full-scale investigation from an official team, since getting approval from their family members would probably be an issue with the wound still so fresh, I answered. That would make sense, I suppose, Emily murmured. So, why do they call it the graveyard if uh, the bodies aren't buried there? Natalie inquired solemnly, her voice low and mildly shaken. Who says they aren't buried there? Bennett grinned back to her, evilly. That's not funny, she remarked. I don't know, really, honestly. I suppose, in tune with keeping the place macabre and creepy, the people who named it supposed memorial wouldn't sound as foreboding. I can assure you the parents didn't name it. Which of them would dare to even think their child was buried unceremoniously so close to the tragedy that had taken their life? I asked softly. Yeah, Emily assented, nodding reverently. So, how much further is it? Bennett asked, his voice scarcely latent with any sympathy. I couldn't necessarily blame him. Even when he lost his family, he seldom showed emotions, and even then... Stoic and recessed qualities. Well, maybe some glazed eyes at his beloved grandmother's funeral, and so on. It'd be even harder for him to empathise with something he was so wholly disconnected from, both through time and association, or the lack thereof. Well, admittedly, I barely felt any welling emotion at the retelling of the story. All humans are like that, I suppose. We're kind of selfish about misery. When we feel it, we want to share it with others. And when others feel misery, we're really just glad we aren't them and enjoy our own lives more. We should be coming up on it soon. It's this wood structure in the middle of these rolling golden fields. We're not going to miss it, I assured him. 
We drove in some silence for a few minutes more, no one thinking to break it as had been done before. I imagined the weight of the retelling was sinking in, at least with the girls. Bennett just seemed antsy, as though he were excited to see the 90s graveyard. We rounded a final bend, and in the distance ahead, centred in the dead grass roughly halfway to the oak tree line, there stood the structure I'd mentioned. That's it, isn't it? Natalie asked, nervously. I nodded. Yep. It had perhaps stood proud at its erection, but... Time and elements had worn down the gazebo-esque structure into little more than a decrepit ruin. As we approached, I remember the details of it more adeptly, recalling the four wooden posts that had been stuck in each corner roughly two feet in circumference and standing just over ten feet tall. At the top, jutting from the centre of each post, there were four wooden beams which conjoined together at the centre. The roof had been wrapped in chicken wire, and all but one wall as well. I remember that when I'd visited so many years ago with my father, the wire had been simply encased in the thick, verdant layer of morning glory vines, the deep indigo flowers blooming and gorgeous. At that time, it was a truly serene and respectful manner to decorate the memorial within. Now, however, as I approached the side of the road and shifted the car into park, I realised simply at a glance that only the brown skeletons of the vines remained, wrapped around the wire in a tight, crooked manner that radiated a derelict nature. I frowned, mildly upset that the once beautiful tribute was already appearing to display a lack of any tending or care. I was puzzled at this. Sure, I had come several years before, nearly a decade at that, but even at that time it had been over ten years since the crash, nearly fifteen, and it was obvious... When my father had showed me inside that the parents cared for the appearance of the place even after so much time. Flowers were placed over the makeshift plaques and never appeared more than a few weeks wilted. The plaques themselves were always kept clean, wiped free of dust and placed back up when they'd fallen. And the vines, of course. Why would they have stopped then when my friends and I had arrived? It seemed well, arbitrary. Bennett loudly belched and pushed open his door, standing outside and stretching. Classy. Natalie rolled her eyes, also exiting the vehicle. Emily looked to me in the rear view once again as I unbuckled, casting a sly grin. You seem bothered, Reese, she commented. Does this place scare you as much as it's scaring Natalie? I looked from her and back to the gazebo again, cocking an eyebrow. It's just... I don't know. Something feels... off, I muttered. How so? She sharply inquired, leaning forward over my seat so she came close. Well, the upkeep on the memorial had been fastidious when I came here with my father, well, so many years after the incident. Oh, it's probably nothing, but it just looks abandoned to me right now. It's summer, she smiled. I have vines like that in my garden, and they always go dormant during this time of year, like the grass and such. She motioned to the surrounding fields. Did you come here with him during fall or spring? Um, I can't remember. I tried to recall, but those specifics were undoubtedly muddled in the haze of my memories. But yeah, it was probably a different season. Okay, well, come on. She patted my shoulder in a friendly manner and grinned at me. We don't want to let Bennett see it first, right? Right. I returned her smile and exited the car, locking the doors and sticking the keys in a pocket of my cargo shorts. It was simply a habit. Well, even if we did seem alone, I wouldn't risk a car passing by and deciding to pill for our belongings. Stranger things had happened to me before. We skipped ahead, catching up to Natalie and Bennett as they trudged through the waist-high tall grass. Check your legs for freaking ticks when you clear this shit, Bennett admonished, looking down to his exposed legs and feet, only protected by flip-flops. Natalie wore short shorts and gasped at this. Oh no, Bennett, can you carry me? She looked at him with big, puppy dog eyes, ones I'd never seen any man be able to resist. Come here, weakling, he joked, 
picking her up and taking her for a piggyback ride. I look back to Emily, the only one of us who wore any leg protection, black denim jeans. She smiled, patting her thigh. <laughs> Jealous? A little, I replied, not really worried about ticks. But in all honesty, I preferred my shorts, thanks to the heat that radiated up from the ground. Well, it, it seemed like casting distorted waves of light past a certain point of view ahead of us. The gazebo was still shimmering in these waves, even for a while as we came nearer. So, visit this, the caves, then... Bennett trailed off. The beach, Natalie exclaimed cheerfully. Again, he grunted. We're only here for a week, you know. We've spent almost every day so far at the stupid beach. I want to go back to that rock jumping spot in that park down PCH. We still have three more days after this, Emily voiced. Plenty of time to do that. And we'll definitely need to cool off after this, huh? Natalie pinched Bennett's cheek, and he quickly pulled away. Oh, I thought the caves would be cool, right, Reese? He turned back to me. I nodded. Yeah, I can't see why they wouldn't be. We were very close to the structure now, and Bennett dropped Natalie when the grass began to clear up. He checked his legs promptly for any black spots, and seemed relieved when he didn't find any. My mighty marine boyfriend, terrified of a bug. Natalie grinned back to us, teasing him. You ever had Lyme disease? No, eh? Well, shut it, he growled. Well, we're here. Emily examined the odd structure up and down, raising her eyebrows. I'm surprised they lugged all this hardware up here just for a memorial. I mean, if you lost your kid, I trailed off, giving her a wry smile. She nodded. Yeah, point taken. Oh, God, let's get in there, Bennett exclaimed, going inside the enclosure first. The three of us followed, and yet only I felt that same nagging, bothersome feeling from earlier, when I realized just what had transpired in the years since I'd been gone. The plaques which actually consisted of many flat, straight objects stuck halfway into the ground, such as wood slats, stones, and even frisbees, were in complete disarray. The names etched and scrawled into the many pseudo-headstones were caked in dusk, the etchings coloured brown with dirt, while the permanent marker on the frisbees were well faded. They lay flat on their faces and backs, the few still in the dirt crooked or leaning backwards. The majority of them had a good caking of dirt intermittently patched over their surfaces, the patches of long-past raindrops evident by the tiny craters within these layers. Nice place, Bennett nodded sarcastically, looking left and right as the wind blew gently through the grass, emitting a soft whistling. Damn, some memorial. Natalie crossed her arms, examining the plaques more closely. It's been years since the crash, dummies. Over two decades, Emily scolded. Yeah, but, I mean, if I lost my kid to some freak accident, I'd at least touch up his grave, or memorial, or whatever. Well, annually, if not more. And this place looks like they haven't touched it since the day after the crash, Bennett commented, kicking up dirt as he scanned the interior of the gazebo, squinting his eyes at the patches of sunlight that made it through the dead vines. All this stuff does look rather old. Natalie bent down and picked up a frisbee, trying to make out the faded marker upon it. Put that down. You don't want their spirits holding animus towards us, do you? I spoke to Natalie, who looked back at me with a crooked grin. Right, yeah. Oh, I'm so scared now. It's literally just old wooden rocks. I thought this would be way more impressive, if I'm honest. Her demeanor had certainly changed. Less apprehensive and more confident now. Or maybe arrogant, like Bennett. Graveyard, huh? So if I dug up underneath one of these things, would I find little white bones? <laughs> he chuckled, dusting at the base of a still upright slat of wood with his sandal. God, that'd be disrespectful, but go on, go ahead. I chided sarcastically, not enjoying the irreverent turn their dispositions had taken. Emily was stoic, however 
standing quietly at the entrance and observing the interior with intrigue. All right, then. We said we can. Natalie? <laughs> Bennett laughed and kneeled down, starting to scrape away at the relatively soft-packed dirt. His calloused hands were scarcely bothered by the strain. I was positive. She giggled, still looking down at the frisbee with something of a drunken stare. It was obvious that the two of them were more high than Emily, and I'd only inhaled the second-hand smoke on the way up, feeling completely lucid. I remember the lucidity perfectly. Bennett, come on, you shouldn't do that. Emily groaned, rolling her eyes. Reese was right. It's pretty disrespectful. Oh, I'm just digging in the dirt, he snickered. Since when was digging dirt disrespectful? Grave robbing, sure, but pulling up sod? You're funny. You're not going to find anything. Natalie grinned at him. I think... He put his fingers up to each temple, pretending to be psychic. I think there's actually buried treasure here. The whole story was a government conspiracy, and half of Fort Knox's gold bars are stored beneath this marker. He then dug even faster, eliciting laughter from Natalie and even Emily now. I stood silently, not really enjoying the moment. Something felt immensely wrong about it. You know, the gut feeling you get when you're doing something you know is illegal, like smashing mailboxes, but you're too drunk and too enamored with your friends to care enough to actually do anything to stop it. Well, it was like that, but deeper, more visceral, more than just a mild twist in the gut at the fear of being caught. It was a potent, lingering feeling, swelling in power and turning all my digestive tract into a roller coaster. I actually remember feeling sick to my stomach. Bennett had suddenly stopped digging, I remember, and his eyes seemed to widen as he stared down into the small hole he'd dug. Wait, he muttered. What is it? Emily asked, walking further in and peering over his shoulder. Natalie matched this, and I followed in a state of morbid curiosity. He'd stopped because he'd hit something that wasn't dirt. It was something staunchly white and smooth, contrasting heavily with the brown surrounding it. Is that a root? Natalie asked offhandedly. Before any of us could even more closely examine the anomaly and determine whether it was a root or rock or something else, there came the noise. It was something that wormed its way into all our minds and rooted itself firmly within. I know this because... I can still hear it clear as day if I try to think about it. I know this because Emily will wake up in a huff sometimes, startling me awake. Always a sudden, gasping breath. She turns her head to me every time, and I ask the same question. Did you hear it again? She always nods. But, well, I digress. Back to the matter at hand. The noise was a giggle. Oh. Four of us, I remember, darted our heads up simultaneously, all in the direction the noise had come from. It was distant, undoubtedly not one of us. I recall this clearly. It had come from the field of grass ahead of the gazebo, towards the tree line. No, it wasn't demonic or excessively loud. It was actually quite subtle. In fact, I doubt any of us would have noticed it, even if one of us had been speaking. It was only because of that moment of silence where we all looked into the hole that I believe it had caught us all so off guard. I mean, imagine it. You're up a giant hill in Malibu and you haven't seen another car or soul for over an hour, 45 minutes of which had taken place on a forgotten dirt road. Nothing so much as tire tracks populates the path up. And here, there's this laughter. The giggles of a child. So out of place, so startling that I swear even Bennett jumped when he heard it. A sound that emanated from some hidden area of the grass far in front of us that caused our group to unanimously peer through the lacings of dead foliage and chicken wire and see nothing. There was no ghostly mirage, no veneer of some horrible parodied corpse, an image of the child that had caused the noise. No, there was nothing. 
I think that may have frightened us all even more than anything we could have seen. And so, with the sun still high in the sky and a combat-hardened marine right next to us, no one hesitated to shoot up and sprint out of the gazebo and back to the car. We covered the ground that had taken us probably three minutes to traverse beforehand in what felt like less than thirty seconds. The sense of dread I felt, and I think that had been instilled in the other three, was simply unnatural. It's difficult for me to describe, but I can only imagine it's identical to the feeling one would get when death was very close. Like the dread a lone hiker may get when he hears the roar of a bear behind him, or a woman stumbling home from a bar too late at night, only to realize the same man who had been following her for three blocks. It was a sickening, palpable terror that I haven't experienced before or since. Well, you can only imagine what I felt like when I jostled the pocket I jammed my car keys into and felt only empty cloth within. The dread accentuated as I witnessed my other three friends desperately trying their handles in the assumption I was working on unlocking the car, ate at me like some advanced cancer, inducing nauseous stupor and faintness. I leaned against the window, retching involuntarily occasionally as I felt sweat drench my brow, and listened to the excited hyperventilation of the other three. It took someone else's voice to break me from my fugue state. Reese, It was Bennett. What are you doing? Open the fucking doors! I stood back up, turned my head behind us, looking to see if anything was chasing. There wasn't, of course, but everyone seemed sufficiently spooked, still including myself. Even though the only noise there was now was the same soft whistling and rustling of the brush as a cool sea breeze blew through, I still felt it. I... I stuttered, unable to fully compose myself. You what? Bennett demanded. I dropped the keys, I moaned, resting my forehead against the driver's window. Reese, Natalie cried, her eyes glazed over. God, why would you even lock the doors to begin with? Bennett barked. I'm worried that some screw will break in. God, we haven't seen another human being for miles. All right, I'm freaking sorry, I bellowed, tearing myself away from the door and glaring at him. He wouldn't have been able to start the car even if we could get in, Bennett. Emily calmly spoke, her voice even and cool. I think that was one of the first moments I really began to fall for her. Yeah, but still, fuck, Bennett exclaimed, pounding his fist on my hood in frustration. God, how do we get out of here now? Yeah, it'd be a really long walk back. Natalie nervously spoke, pulling out her cell phone, presumably to check for reception. Yeah, and it's already past three. Aren't there mountain lions out here? Yeah, there are, Bennett glowered at me as he answered her question. Oh God, and it would take a few good hours to go all the way back down the road on foot, considering how speedily we shot up here in Reese's car. Bennett... Emily lowered her brow at him. Blaming Reese for a simple accident won't help us get out of here any faster. We're not going to leave the car, and we're not going to walk back, because we have to go back and find where the keys were dropped. I smiled at her, glad someone had my back. Though I technically had sole utilization of the SUV, my parents still paid for mechanic visits and insurance at the time. If I left it up there and had to get it towed over something so stupid, they would have been furious. But I don't want to go back there, Natalie moaned, looking worriedly back into the field, scanning it for any odd movement. Yeah, God, that shit was terrifying. God, I hate to say it, but something wasn't right about that. Bennett grunted, also peering back into the distant tree line and gazebo. But, well... I want to think it's just a kid hiding in the grass. His parents are somewhere in the trees back there hiking. I mean, we all heard it right. It's not just my high right, Natalie asked. She barely even gave a thought to Bennett's potential explanation, it appeared. I nodded at her. No, we all heard it. I'm not even high, and I heard it. Oh, fuck, 
she groaned, sinking down to the road as she leaned against the vehicle. Look, we have to do it now, while the sun's still out. There's only a couple of hours and there's no way we can stay out here past dark. If we do, I'm bashing in the window and unlocking it from the inside. Look, I'll pay for the repairs my damn self, but there's no way we're spending the night out here. Not after that shit, Bennett lamented. And how would you start the car? Emily inquired. I was positively impressed with how calm and collected she was acting in the simply impossible situation. I'll just look about a hot wire. No big shit. Bennett held up his smartphone. Oh, God, there's no service up here. Natalie sighed hopelessly. Bennett cocked an eyebrow and lit up his phone screen. When he saw it, the reaction was immediate. Oh, fuck, he exclaimed. I have none as well. Bloody hell. Emily looked down at her phone. I checked my own and was unsurprised to find there was a circle slash in the place of where my service bar should have been. <sighs> I'll just walk down the hill a ways and wait until I get a bar, Bennett suggested. That won't work either, Natalie groaned. My service went out even before we turned into the freaking dirt road. Oh, shit, he grunted, putting his hands on his hips. I don't know about you guys, but I'm back tranging. We're going to find those keys, Emily definitively stated. What happens if we can't find them? What if it gets dark? Natalie worriedly asked. I have flashlights for when we're supposed to go inside the cave. I spoke up, grateful I'd stored the four small LEDs in a zip-up pocket and not left them in the car with everything else. Besides, if all else fails, the compass I have on my keychain glows in the dark. Probably won't come to that, Emily replied, looking to me with a slight smile. All we have to do is follow the grass that we flattened on the way there and back. Easy peasy. Yeah, I guess you're right, Bennett sighed, looking down the slight path we'd left behind. Shouldn't be a needle in a haystack. Just a pair of keys in a haystack. Not even that, I spoke, trying to stay positive. Come on now. Ah, oh, well, we better get looking. Bennett turned to face our path and started walking. Emily and I followed, only to be interrupted by a cry from behind us. Wait, I can't go back there, guys. Please. God, my anxiety is driving me insane. Natalie looked after us, and I realized only now that she was still hyperventilating. She'd never stopped even after we'd reached the car and spoke. She was likely having a terrible panic attack. I'd seen her get them before. There was no way she was lying just to avoid going back. Bennett looked back to us and pursed his lips, sighing. Sorry, guys. I need to calm her down, or else it's only going to get worse. We'll be with you in a few minutes, okay? Go, on, man. Help her out. I nodded, sticking out a fist. He smiled shortly and bumped it. Bennett was always like that. He would explode in fury like dynamite, but also like dynamite, he always cleared up his anger incredibly fast. Yeah, go help her. We have this. Right, Reese? Emily smiled to me confidently, something I found difficulty in not returning. We searched the entire path, not seeing the black anomaly anywhere in our first sweep. We trod all the way back to the gazebo, though I was reluctant to do this. From her body language, I could see Emily was nervous too. Bennett took much longer than a few minutes to calm Natalie down. It had been over an hour of fruitless searching before the two had even tried to get up. Even then, it appeared Natalie needed much goading to move from the road and into the field. The four of us searched high and low, from the gazebo to under the car, yet to no purchase. Bennett smashed down the grass surrounding our scant trail widening our ability to view any sudden changes of colour from the ubiquitous gold. I helped him with the other side, though I didn't find a single thing beside grass. Not even a rock, or a spider. We kept on, the high wearing away from my friends as they worked, and the light began to lower. I remember this had only been the early summer, so the days had not grown too long yet. Despite thirst and hunger, 
We kept at it for three hours past Emily's and I's initial search. I retraced my steps to the letter, searching a berth of five feet in either direction with my friends. By the time the sun was setting, we'd carved out a ten-foot path of flattened grass, leading the roughly two football fields from the car to the 90s graveyard. The mark of 7.30, when the sun had finally set behind the higher end of the mountain behind us, where the caves were, Bennett exclaimed and heaved the shirt he'd wrapped around his head to the ground in anger. Oh, this is fucking crazy, he screamed into the open, actually causing some roosting seagulls in the distant oaks to go flying. Where is it? We searched everywhere, Natalie cried, sitting down in the centre of the enormous trail we'd made and burying her head in her knees. We should have just walked down the mountain. I'm so thirsty and tired. Yeah, she's not wrong. It would have taken way less time than this bullshit, Bennett growled and approached me. Look, you're positive you didn't leave them in the car or in another pocket. God, I'd be pissed if you did, but... At least I wouldn't feel like I was losing my goddamn head. I've already checked every pocket like a dozen times, I sighed. And I'm completely certain I didn't leave them in the car. I'm positive of that. I have a very clear mental image of putting them in my pocket. Oh, shit, he hissed, and looked back towards the graveyard. God, I can't believe the sun's going down already. This is actually the worst case scenario. I could tell he wasn't upset with me. He was just furious with the situation. Even Natalie, who was still freaking out, had told me how stupid it was we hadn't found the keys already, and how there was no way they could have been anywhere besides our path. On the bright side, it will probably be easier to find them once the light gets lower, Emily commented, not sounding too upset. Though I was a nervous wreck at the thought of locking my friends out of the car, possibly needing a tow truck if worse came to worse, and, most of all, having to spend a night in this creepy place, I maintained a facade of calmness. I didn't want to disappoint Emily, after all. She'd held on to her composure since the start of the entire fiasco. She's right, I said. We'll probably see them as soon as it gets a little darker. Then we'll be out of this nightmare. Yeah, I suppose, Bennett sighed sitting down next to Natalie and rubbing her back as she rocked back and forth on the ground. So we sat and waited. We waited until the light of the sun was no longer a glowing orange and had faded into a pale blue, a blue that seemed to be getting darker with every second that passed. Soon, we wouldn't even make out anything beyond a silhouette of where the once clearly defined 90s graveyard stood. The grass shifted from a rich gold to a bluish white, still blowing gently in the sea breeze. In the far distance, we heard the roaring of the cars on PCH, a low and constant droning that had remained as persistent as the marine wind. Now that the sun had gone down, additionally, the wind chill was becoming more noticeable. Natalie, Bennett and I were all beginning to shiver somewhat, although Emily was more comfortable in her pants, it appeared. We sat back at the car and waited until this late state of twilight came. I'd already doled out the flashlights, and I fiddled with my own nervously. We'll find them, Reese. Don't fret. Emily smiled at me, whispering so Bennett and Natalie wouldn't hear. I know. I forced a smile back, scarcely able to make out the finer details in her face with such low light. All right. Let's get out of here. Look, we'll stick together because I'm not in some creepy little ghost shit or whatever scare anyone to death tonight, Bennett announced, standing up and beginning to walk into the rather foreboding-looking field. Please don't say that. Natalie hugged him closely from behind, clearly out of her wits. Emily and I followed in our own pair, following the flattened grass two by two. No one had actually activated their torches yet, although the darkness was fast waxing, and it would become a necessity in scant minutes. See anything? Bennett asked in a surprisingly low voice, almost as though he were trying to remain stealthy. From what, I don't know. I don't want to know what he thought we should be hiding from. Even today, the memories of my own rampant imagination's dark fantasies at the time were almost too much to handle. Even if we heard a single noise that didn't belong, 
I felt we'd all just dart back as fast as we had before, and Bennett would deliver on his promise of smashing in a window. Even if we couldn't flee, at the very least we could huddle together and spend a sleepless night in the car under beach towels. The situation was immensely tense and fragile, and all of us knew it. We trudged through the path, back and forth, and eventually we had no choice but to turn on the lights and start scanning the area. My phone had read 8.30 when I'd last checked, and the sun was long dead at this point. I can't recall exactly who it was. I think it was Natalie, but someone had exclaimed in a voice that sounded both excited and fear-filled. A glow had been spotted. I was elated at the news, and turned to face where Natalie... I assume, was pointing. I can scarcely even remember anything at this point, so bear with me. Bennett was pointing his flashlight in the direction as well, and promptly lowered it when Emily and I arrived to see where the glow was coming from. I distinctly remember my face falling and my stomach overturning when I realised why Natalie's voice was so shaky. We were roughly halfway down the path we'd made, and all looked in the direction of the 90s graveyard. Past it, actually. There. Very faintly in the oak tree line. There we saw it. A very faint, greenish glow, suspended above the ground in the dark forest of trees. It appeared only slightly inside the oaks, but this did little to assuage the facts. The facts that Not one of us had even passed the 90s graveyard, or even thought of venturing into the trees, even when it had been light out. We all stood in abject silence and nervousness, all looking in the distant direction, roughly three football fields from where we stood. Bennett, as I expected, was the one to first speak up. Are you fucking kidding me? This is some really scary, horrible, bad shit, Natalie whimpered, hardly able to sound coherent. I couldn't blame her. It was, in fact, a terrifying idea of how they'd gotten there. And in the dark, ideas like that were only scarier. Even Emily, who had been stoic and calm the entire time, had wide eyes, her arms visibly coated with goose flesh, as I could tell from the periphery of the flashlights. Bennett pointed his light toward the trees, but he had no hope of illuminating the foliage from such a distance. How in God's name did that happen? I croaked, voice barely above a whisper. This place is fucking evil. That's how, Bennett grunted, sounding both frustrated and nervous. Though he certainly displayed less fear than any of the other three of us. So, we'll go grab him as a group then book it back to the car. Then we drive straight back to the hotel and forget this shit ever happened, okay? Natalie swallowed, beginning to sob. Emily was motionless like a statue. I nodded and uttered a weak reply. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I can't. Natalie cried softly. I just can't go over there, guys. I'm so sorry. Natalie. Bennett started. Bennett, I can't do it, she exclaimed defiantly. You couldn't pay me any amount of money to get me over there. Really? Even a car ride home? A hot shower? Room service for dinner? And a gallon of water each? He smiled to her, confident. I... She sputtered. We'll all be right next to each other. Like he said. Emily looked at her friend eyes determined. We're not going to let whatever in the hell this is stop us from getting home. But it's so obvious, Natalie choked. It's trying to lure us in. And do what? Bennett chuckled. Laugh at us again. Don't say that, Natalie moaned fearfully. Sorry, he murmured, and looked at Emily and I. You guys are ready to get the fuck out of here? I nodded, inspired by his fearlessness. Yeah, let's just do it already. I agree, Emily tersely responded. Okay, everyone follow me, single file. 
I promise no one's going to get hurt from this stupid bullshit. No one's ever been hurt by... He trailed off, unable to finish his sentence. Bennett was an ardent sceptic before that day. Hard-headed as he was, finishing such a sentence would have been embarrassing. Let's just go. He started ahead, and we followed closely. Natalie was at the back, squeezing Emily's hand as the two girls walked behind me and me behind Bennett. We passed the graveyard and trudged into more tall grass, reaching up to our waists. The wind had died down, and were it not for the droning of cars in the far distance, out on PCH, the silence would have been unbearable. But we kept on, staying close, and crunching through the grass as we came closer and closer to the glow hanging somewhere in the trees. Roughly one football field's worth away from the tree line, Bennett raised a fist up, as though he were leading his squad of marines, signalling us to cease. What? Natalie hissed, clearly terrified. Bennett turned his light to the grass to our right, and illuminated a large patch of it in particular. Instinctively, we all turned our lights there as well. The patch of grass was gently moving. Only that patch. There was no wind. Natalie squeaked, covering her mouth as tears began to roll down her cheeks. It's just an animal. I was worried it was a freaking puma. Bennett edified us and started on again. Only about ten steps past the rustling brush, however, there was a noise we froze when we heard it. Another giggle. Quiet, subtle, almost imperceptible, but undoubtedly what it was. The short laughter of a small child, disappearing after only two seconds of the gentle chortle. Ah, oh, fuck you, Bennett screamed in the direction of the laughter, shining his light on the nothing that was there. Natalie now began liberally crying, trying to muffle her noise as best she could. I looked back, matching Emily's gaze. Her eyes were wide and filled with horror. And positive mine were, too. Guys, come on, it's nothing. Let's book this shit. Bennett carried on, resolved to end the nightmare. He picked up the pace to a light jog, and we all followed closely not daring to fall behind. He turned his head back at where the noise had come from and bared his teeth, clearly infuriated. But I could tell he was also feeling something else. The sheer desperation and shaking anger in his tone. He was afraid too. You hear that, you little shit? You're nothing! He called back, hatefully taunting whatever had made the noise, only to be met with more silence. We were getting very close to the trees, and consequently the glowing. Fifty yards. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. We continued until Bennett charged past the first trees, making a beeline for the glow, which, due to our proximity and lighting, most definitely came from my keys. They hung from a branch, not actually very high. Only about five feet. Bennett wasted no time in snagging them and turning around, looking to the three of us with wide, wild eyes. Okay, guys, just stay close and run. We're almost out of this, he ordered, the glints of our lights in his eyes making him look even more feral. But it was a good feral. It was clear he was angry and tired. Even if it was obvious he was afraid, too. Having him there on that horrible night made things so much better than they would have been. He was acting the most human of us, I believe, in those moments. A boisterous, crude and powerful human, but that's in retrospect. At the time, Natalie was crying uncontrollably, clearly terrified. Emily gasped when another giggle emanated from deep within the trees, behind Bennett. He whirled around, shining his light past the many trunks, unable to illuminate any tangible thing that could have possibly echoed that laugh out. Just the dark, foreboding tree trunks, continuing into what seemed like forever. 
I felt about ready to piss my pants at this point. Another laugh, clearly belonging to a child, came from our left, sounding alarmingly close. Bennett didn't look for it this time, nor did I when I heard a laugh directly in my right ear, making me jump nearly out of my shoes. Run! he exclaimed, bolting back from the trees and into the field once more, tearing through the grass at a speed I had never seen him run. I charged after him, just barely tailing his form. I heard Natalie screaming from behind me. God help me, I was too afraid to look back. Emily's nimble, silent footsteps matched mine from directly behind, her light bobbing wildly up and down over Bennett, and he began to make ground over us. Her breaths were laboured and shaking, and she seemed to be sticking to me more than anything. Natalie's cries and screams still came from behind, but they weren't fading. We weren't outrunning her. That's all I needed to know to feel justified in not looking back. She was just at the rear, a position I would have been too afraid to be in myself. We ran well away from the oaks, but there was far more ground to cover before we reached the car. Grass ran up, brushing upon our legs, scratching and biting like they were coated in teeth. Though in these few seconds, there had been no more giggles, and we held our speed, not daring to look back for fear of what we might have seen. I saw the dark shadows of the 90s graveyard far ahead, now only visible thanks to the periphery of our wildly shaking beams of light. Bennett was a figure in the distance, well ahead of us by at least a hundred yards. It was only when we passed the gazebo I heard the loud yelp and consequent thud behind me. Despite myself, I found the fortitude to turn around and see exactly what had happened, whether it had been Natalie or Emily who had been stopped. It was, indeed, Emily. She appeared to have tripped and nearly face-planted into the grass. She moaned in pain, trying to get her bearings, I noticed when she put pressure on her wrist, attempted to get back up, that she quickly faltered and cried in pain. Natalie had bolted past, probably not even thinking anything besides what Bennett had implored of us, to run. I shot my flashlight down and didn't even try to rationalise the situation to myself as I reached down and pulled her up by a good arm. She fumbled for her light with her bad hand, but she was unable to grasp it, moaning in pain as her fingers attempted to flex over it. Just leave it, I rasped, voice hoarse with exertion and terror. Something, grab me, she cried, no longer trying to hide her fear. You just tripped. Come on. I pulled her forward and we continued through the grass, Emily limping to match my speed as best she could. Though I didn't relent in my own speed, I made sure to keep a hold of her and not let her fall behind. There came another laugh, somewhere back near the gazebo. I refused to look and kept my eyes trained on the distant white lights of Natalie and Bennett ahead. They both appeared to have nearly approached my SUV. I felt a sudden surge of that similar dread that I'd felt earlier and nearly became crippled by just how potent it felt. Nausea overwhelmed me, and faintness felt imminent. It seemed Emily felt it too, because I practically began dragging her through the field. Though we'd approached the large, flattened road we'd made earlier, I kept my eyes to our left and right, trying to make out if anything was trying to flank us. I only did this because there came some more laughs and rustles from both sides, hidden in the grass. The laughs were swelling in numbers, now ambiently coming from both sides and rising in volume. No longer were they subtle, gentle nuances in the silence of the hallow grounds. Now they were sounding more high-pitched, less friendly, if there had ever been such an intention. As they carried on, they repeated themselves like broken records, starting the same rises in giggling before cutting themselves off and promptly repeating at even higher decibel levels. Some of them had even begun to sound like banshee wails, piercing our ears and sounding like they were coming from every side. Behind, left, right, and even directly in front of us, even though we saw there was clearly nothing. 
You ever heard the cries of a mountain lion? That horrible, high-pitched shriek that sounds like the cries of a hellspawn, even from miles away. That was what surrounded us in those moments. At long last, Emily and I reached the car, and both realized that Bennett had already started it, and revved the engine, spinning it around so the front faced the exit, and not the caves. He'd pushed the passenger door open, and was beckoning us inside hurriedly. Natalie appeared to be in the back, huddled up and sobbing uncontrollably. I didn't care how tight of a squeeze it was, I threw myself into the front passenger seat and pulled Emily in after me. She quickly pulled her legs in with a wince of pain, crying out as her feet bumped against my own legs. I yanked the door closed and snapped my frantic expression to Bennett, well illuminated since one of them had turned on the interior lamp above. Absent-mindedly, perhaps out of rote remembrance, I turned off my light and yelled at him, Go! 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 Bennett wasted no time and tried shifting the vehicle into drive again. Tried. The transmission appeared jammed, and he shoved furiously at it, causing a fear to surface that he would break it. What the fuck? He shouted in lividness, trying to pull it in the opposite direction, yet to only yield the same result. Emily was looking out the passenger window, perhaps in morbid curiosity as she sat atop me, still hyperventilating. Her eyes were squinting, like he was trying to make something out. I felt my body go numb when I saw them widen and turn my own head to see what had caused her fear. It was the 90s graveyard, at least right next to it, where she'd fallen and left the cheap LED flashlight behind. The two of us watched in terror as the distant white circle of light rose up from the grass and pointed at us. It was far away and the darkness behind it seemed impregnable. It was impossible to tell what had picked it up. Bennett, I stuttered, looking to him quickly, and then back to the light. What? he barked, turning off the ignition and re-firing the engine. Bennett! Emily shrieked, terrified when she saw what happened next. The light was moving towards us. This was no elaborate prank, I realized. Even in the moments, I quickly surmised how impossible this would all be. But it wasn't a dream, either. I only gasped in matching horror when I saw just how fast the light was moving. It wasn't bobbing up and down, as though a fellow human being was sprinting with it. No, it sped across the grass with an unmoving resolve as though the circle of white shot along the world's fastest invisible conveyor belt, heading straight towards us. It had only been about three seconds since it had risen up, but it already looked halfway towards us, and it was not relenting. Bennett, finally able to shift the gear into drive, shortly looked up to see why we were so afraid, and I saw his expression falter into one of fear. Holy shit! He exclaimed, flooring the gas and now speeding out of the parking spot without floor. As he peeled out and quickly left the light behind, Emily and I were both frightened to see that it shot onto the road, where we'd just been, and turned towards us, still moving at its prodigious speed. Faster, faster, I exclaimed, looking behind us. Shit, Bennett grunted, peering into the rear view and accelerating even more, practically drifting around a bend and gunning the SUV out of the turn. Once we passed the turn, however, the light did not shine again, or continue chasing us. As we drove down the road as fast as we could, without being able to make proper turns, and I kept my eyes glued to the rear window, Bennett sighed a breath of relief. Emily, still hyperventilating, groaned softly in pain and held her wrist, feeling for how badly it had been injured. She kicked her foot a few times and winced again in discomfort. Are you okay? I asked, voice barely above a whisper. I think the hand might be sprained. My ankle's definitely twisted, she murmured, stifling her pain by clenching her teeth. 
She turned back to face me, her face very close to mine now. Thanks, Reese. Really? I nodded solemnly. No one should have had to stay back there, even for a second longer. Nat, you okay? Bennett looked in the rear view. Yeah, she sputtered, wiping her tears away. Is Em's okay? He asked me. I just said what happened. And she rolled her eyes in reply. We should stop by a hospital on the way back, I muttered. Yeah, good plan, Bennett replied in an equally low, jaded tone. But are we seriously not going to talk about what happened back there? Natalie suddenly raised her voice, shrill and scared. Oh, it was a joke, a prank, Bennett meekly murmured, clearly not sure of himself. Somebody probably wired up speakers and... I don't know, he trailed off. Really? So someone snagged Reese's keys while he wasn't looking and planted them in the bloody woods without any of us seeing? Emily demanded. And what about the flashlight? God, that was real, Natalie whimpered. She sounded nauseous. Look, everyone just calm down. I'm sure there was an explanation for all of it. Nat, uh, maybe a dealer gave us some bad shit, and we just imagine... Imagine the laughs at all the same exact time. Well, Reese wasn't even high, Emily interrupted. Oh, God, I don't know, Bennett exclaimed, angered by the situation. The stories. They were real, I somberly whispered. You'll freak that out, Reese. Look, stop, Bennett snapped. That would explain why no one went up there for all this time. The earth must have gone sour or something, I mused dourly. Yeah, I guess you were right all along about the vines, Emily murmured, not sounding happy that she had to agree with the imposing implications. No one spoke beyond Emily's final statement for the rest of the car ride back into town. We stopped by the hospital and got Emily's foot and wrist splinted. We had to tell the nurses she'd gotten the injuries hiking. Even given our shock-induced state, we had faculties enough to manage not to sound insane and instead give rational explanations. We arrived at the hotel just past midnight, all exhausted and still silent. None of us had anything to say. We were all so consumed by what had just happened, reviewing the all-too-clear memories over and over again as we tacitly made our way back to our rooms. Bennett ushered Natalie inside theirs and looked at Emily and I before entering himself. He gave a short nod and said nothing as he followed his girlfriend inside. Emily and I stood in the quiet, well-lit hall in silence, only the humming of the vending machine at the end of the carpeted corridor keeping a minor ambience. I remember sighing and starting from my room, but Emily took my hand with her good one and looked to me with imploring eyes. Stay with me, Reese, she softly pleaded. I nodded quickly, reluctant to spend the night alone myself. I followed her inside, and that was the first night we shared the same bed. I remember there was scarce sleep, waking up when I thought I heard the muffled laughter of children outside our door. I felt Emily stir a lot as well, cast over with the harrowing events that still replayed like clockwork in our heads. After the rest of that vacation, a piece of it stayed with all of us. Emily and I always become nervous when we pass elementary schools or daycare centres. Bennett and Natalie remain close, even today. I suppose trauma does that to people. When Bennett and I drank, sometimes he brought up that day, telling me nothing he'd seen in the military matched the sheer strangeness and dread that had been instilled that day. He told me, in his inebriated state, that ghosts had to exist because what we saw on that day was simply unnatural. Although we would never admit this to anyone sober, and I, well, I don't know why I decided to tell this. I suppose it feels better, getting it out there, even if it does force me to live through the repressed memories again. I don't think anything out there, near the angel caves, could have actually hurt us. 
In retrospect, the things that happened felt vaguely mischievous, like the way a child would play a game. My keys hanging no higher than a child could reach. The flashlight that Emily had dropped barely raising above the level of the grass. The pieces add up. Oh, and the laughter, of course. The most brazen and most terrifying part of it all. It's getting late now, and Emily is calling me to bed. But take heed from this story if you can. Learn from our mistakes. If there's a place where people can easily go, and yet it always remains deserted, that's never a good sign. Especially when it comes to urban exploration. Bring friends, and be prepared for the worst. Also, another thing. The uh, crux of this moral, if you will. If you're ever travelling a canyon road in Malibu, running parallel to PCH, separated from it by a mountain, and you see an unmarked dirt road leading upwards, avoid it. I know there are a lot of different paths that it forks into up there, and only one leads to the Angel Caves, but I won't say which. I would genuinely hate myself if someone read this, and decided to pursue a farce into that haunted place. Just remember, some stones are better left unturned, especially headstones. So there you go, my dear friends, that's The Angel Caves, a story that I've been promising you for quite a while, and one that I started recording a long, long time ago, and once again I cannot for the life of me imagine why it's taken me this long to finish it. But finish it I have, and I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did reading it all for you. You did, didn't you? Well, if you didn't, let me know why. What's wrong with you? (laughs) And if you enjoyed it, tell me what you liked, and um, another one is coming up for you in just a couple of days. Excited already, aren't you? I certainly hope so. Well, that is definitely enough for me for one evening. Uh, Glad you could join me around the campfire again. Had a lot of fun, didn't we? More fun coming soon. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store. Pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?